three days in the making. Are we going to look back at this as a turning point in the war? I'm not sure yet. So we don't have a lot of information. It's murky still. This is the third day, but it is a big deal. It's the largest force of Ukrainian soldiers going into Russia since the war started, more than 900 days since the war started. So there's a couple of things that I would watch. I would. Uh, there's four different brigades that the Ukrainians have used. Uh, we don't know the numbers. The Russians are saying 1,000 to 2,000 Ukrainian soldiers yes. are there. And I, I think everyone's struggling to understand what, why now and, and what the purpose behind it is. Mm. And, and there's a couple of guesses. Well, what are your guesses here? Is this Ukraine actually trying to take control of Russian territory? Are they trying to take out Russian capabilities that emanate from here? Like, what exactly is, is the end game? Kaylee, so uh, uh, what a difference a day makes. Yesterday, the Financial Times ran a story that basically said everything is terrible in Ukraine. The, the, the fighting is getting really, really hard in the Donbass, right? That was yesterday. And then today, everyone is jubilant. So we've seen a complete change in, in headlines. Uh, it, the, the Ukrainians have decided that they're not just going to sit there and wait and, and be assaulted and, and sit in a defensive position. So part of it is showing momentum and showing the West what they can do. We see images on social media of the Ukrainians using German armored vehicles and American armored vehicles. Hmm. So it's partly a message to the West. Well, that's important. What's the U.S.'s uh, philosophy then? Uh, is, is it evolving on, on the use of American provided weapons offensively against Russia? Not so far. So that's something that I would be watching. There was pressure on the Biden administration to lift the restrictions that they yeah. put in place. And as you know, in May and June, we saw a horrible humanitarian crisis in Kharkiv, that city up in northeastern Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And finally, the Biden administration relented a little bit. But most of the targets, more than 80 percent of the targets that Ukraine would like to strike are still off limits. So is there a risk here that the Ukrainians, if they want to continue with this incursion, are going to run into direct conflict with what U.S. policy is and that we could see some friction? Or do you think it's more likely that U.S. policy would adjust in order for the Ukrainians to do what they need to do with what they've started? So both the, the Defense Department and the White House have said yeah, we support this. And the Germans said that as well. And the White House is being a little legalistic. They're saying, look, the it's completely fine if the Ukrainians use our weapon systems because the attack originated from from a place where the Russians have used uh, our weapons before. So it, it's in line with the policy. They're taking a very legalistic approach to it. The Germans took a more open ended approach. They said when we give the Ukrainians weapons, they're Ukrainian weapons. Hmm. And under international law, uh, both parties are, are, are bo both Russia and Ukraine are party to this conflict. So go ahead and defend your territory. Hmm. The, the way it's qualified uh, from the White House, in this case through John Kirby, uh, that this action type of action is restricted to target imminent threats just across the border. You could call a lot of things an imminent threat. Are we to believe that Ukraine was about to be attacked from that side of the, of the border? So, Joe, that's another one of the theories is that Ukraine knew that this attack was coming, that there was an imminent attack coming from Russia. Yeah. And rather than just waiting, they went in and nipped at the butt. We don't know yet. And the Ukrainian side is being very quiet for operational reasons, yeah. as they should be. Well, of course, you have a lot more insight into Ukrainian thinking and, frankly, what it's like on the ground than most. You were just in Ukraine for weeks. What did you see? What did it tell you about where exactly we are in this war? So we're about 900 days in, and everyone is worried about winter. The discussions are about how hard winter is going to be, and everyone I know is preparing. So they have a plan A, B, and C, and they're preparing batteries in their homes to keep their apartments going when there's blackouts, and there's already tremendous blackouts. So in the city of Kiev, the capital, there's two hours of power in the morning and two hours of power at night. It's really hard to run a business. It's really hard to have children. There's no air conditioning, right? And it's really hot. There was a huge, there was a hundred degree weather there. I was studying and I found myself studying by candlelight, mm -hmm. often at night. I would take a shower and the power would be cut. Now I was in Lviv, which is Disneyland. It, it's great. <laughs> but the further east you go, the more difficult it is. So everyone's focused on winter. And I kept asking mayors, energy officials, how bad is it going to be this winter? And no one knows. It depends on the temperature and how severe the strikes are from the Russian side. Mm -hmm. We saw, lastly, uh, Melinda, images of F-16s uh, flying over Ukraine. At last, President Zelensky got his F-16s. Was that for show, 
or can they actually be used effectively in this war? So it is a victory that Ukraine has F-16s. They're, the number is under 10, mm. and it's not going to be a game changer. We waited way too long to get them F-16s. We haven't given them a sufficient number. And the way that the, the front line is arrayed now, they're going to, they're going to play defense. They're going to shoot down Russian missiles. Uh, Russia has its air defenses out on the front, and it will shoot down F-16s if, we, if the Ukrainians try to put these F-16s too far out in front. So it's good, it's insufficient, and it won't be a game changer.